Welcome, everyone. It gives me immense pleasure to introduce today's panel, um, where we will be discussing Tim Fry's latest book, Weak Strongman, The Limits of Power in, in Putin's America. Uh, Tim is a dear friend and colleague, going back to the days when he was a graduate student at, uh, at Columbia when I first started as an assistant professor. So it's, it's uh, really terrific and, uh, and an honor for me to moderate this panel. Uh, Tim continues to be on the forefront of scholarship on, on uh, the post-Soviet era, and I'm sure this book will be an important contribution to the literature about, not just about Russia, but also about how uh, we have retrenchments in democracy and the, and the resurgence of authoritarian regimes throughout the world. Um, we have uh, a panel of uh, three discussants today, um, and I will introduce them in turn. Um, so uh, Keith Gesson is a professor at the Columbia School of Journalism here at uh, um, Morningside Heights. Uh, Steve Kotkin is a professor of history and international affairs at Princeton University, and uh, Vicky Murillo is uh, a professor of political science at Columbia and is also serving as director for the Institute of Latin American Studies. Uh, so without further ado, I will hand it over to Tim, who's going to talk a bit about his book before the other commentators chime in. Great. Thanks a lot. Um, it's really a pleasure to be here. And I want to thank the organizers and the panelists for taking time out of their busy schedules, particularly during a, a pandemic. So I really appreciate uh, um, uh, your efforts, and I look forward to he having, hearing what you have to say uh, about the book. So the, the simplest way to describe Weak Strongman, The Limits of Power in Putin's Russia is that it's an explainer book. It translates what I think is the best academic research on Russia over the last decade for a general audience on a host of interesting questions. Is Putin really popular? Do elections matter? Is propaganda effective? Why are relations with the West so fraught? And similar kinds of questions. Um, the book should have something for you, whether you identify as a Russia hand or whether you identify as just someone who's Russia curious. Uh, now, there's no shortage of books on Russia. Uh, so why should you read this one? Um, well, this book departs from existing works on Russia, I think, in three ways. Um, the first departure is that I critique two of the most common narratives on Russia, and uh, I'll call them the, the Putinology explanation and the exceptional Russia explanation, and I'll caricature them here uh, just in the interest of time a little bit, um, but there is you know, quite a bit of truth in these, um, in these two views. So let me just illustrate uh, these two views with an explanation of the arrest of Mikhail Khodorkovsky and the expropriation of the largest uh, oil company in Russia in 2003. So some emphasize the personal role of Putin. Uh, he's an ex-KGB man with little interest in markets who seizes Yukos in order to reward his, his cronies and consolidate power. And this Putinology view says that we should view Russian politics largely as a reflection of Putin's KGB background and his seeming omnipotence. Russia is the way it is because that's the way Putin is. Uh, others attribute the takeover of Yukos to Russia's historic fusion of private and state property and Russia's supposed lack of interest in markets and democracy. And this view suggests that we should see Russian politics through the lens of Russia's unique history and culture. Uh, in its strongest version, uh, it argues that there is a homo sovieticus, a uniquely post-Soviet mentality that uh, allows Russians to favor a strong hand and that uh, uh, Russia is the way it is because that's the way Russians are. Now, one problem with this view is that similar expropriations of energy companies took place around the same time in countries as diverse as Algeria, Bolivia, Chad, Ecuador, Dubai, Senegal, and Venezuela. And if we look at autocracies from 1946 to 2010, what we see is when oil prices are high in autocracies, nationalizations are much more common. So like a lot of Russian politics, the takeover of Yukos was driven less by Putin's background or Russia's unique history than to patterns common to autocratic rule. Uh, uh, Russia, rather than treating Putin's Russia as uh, 
uh, led by a unique leader overseeing a unique country, I argue that we should view Putin's Russia as a personless autocracy. This is a type of autocracy led by a single individual. And in these countries, the pattern of politics differs from autocracies that are led by a military such as Pinochet's Chile or contemporary Myanmar or by parties as in the case of contemporary China or the uh, Soviet Union. Now these leaders in personless autocracy, they rule based on a mixture of personal popularity and propaganda and good performance. They do have to deliver some goods in order to gain a uh, popular support. And they also rely on coercion and repression like all autocrats do, but they try to avoid it because it's quite costly. Um, now, uh, although these leaders and personalist autocracies have all formal power in their own hands, I argue that they faced a host of difficult trade-offs. And it's really important to understand these trade-offs if we want to understand politics in these countries. And in su successive chapters on Putin's popularity, on elections, on the economy, on foreign policy, I identify these trade-offs. For example, in looking at Russian elections, the autocrat faces a problem of if you cheat too little, you risk losing, but if you cheat too much, you might signal weakness and then spark a backlash. Um, you need to use corruption to reward your inner circle, but at the same time, you can't allow so much corruption that it slows growth and might foment popular po protest. Uh, uh, autocrats in these personal regimes manipulate the news, but not so much that people stop watching the TV. Uh, they use anti-Westernism to rile the base, but not so much that it actually provokes a war. And if we look at personalist autocracies, we also see patterns um, that differ from military regimes and one party led regimes. Growth tends to be slower. Policies tend to be more volatile. Uh, repression uh, seems to be higher. And uh, um, uh, you know, when we look at Russia, this you know, sounds like a pretty uh, familiar picture. So rather than treating Putin as all powerful, I highlight the difficult trade-offs that confront the Kremlin. And uh, it's important to note that these trade-offs are a problem, but it doesn't mean that Putin is going to fall from power anytime soon. It just means that governing Russia poses a host of challenge and having all formal power does not mean that you're able to do whatever you want. In a sense, it's not really a Putin book. Uh, really, the book argues that we need to look beyond Putin to understand Russian politics, to probe the diverse trends in Russian society, and to figure out which groups within Russian society challenge Putin's rule, and also which groups buttress Putin's rule because he has had fairly high levels of support at various times over the last 20 years. So that's one big departure. Uh, a second departure is that um, uh, I rely on academic research in writing about Russia. There's lots of great writing on Russia by journalists. There's lots of great long form writing on Russia. And I think one could make the case that the quality of this writing is better than it is for lots of other countries. But my book doesn't do that. Uh, I couldn't compete with the journalists on that front. Um, instead, I try to highlight this academic research on Russia, which has been really terrific. It's really uh, not well understood, but Russia has been a great place to study autocracy in the last 20 years. Um, the quality of public opinion is much better than many other autocracies. The quality of the administrative data on elections, on growth, and on social indicators is better than in other autocracies. And it really helps that Russia is a very well educated country. And it's important to note that many of the best scholars writing on Russia today are Russians. Uh, in the last 15 years, I've had as many Russian co-authors as US co-authors. And this has really been uh, uh, overlooked, I think, in the broader debate on Russia. So in the book, you'll see how my colleagues and I conduct surveys to figure out whether Russians are lying when they answer questions about Putin's approval, how we uh, track bots on Twitter to identify propaganda campaigns, uh, how we track uh, political graffiti in Russia to map protests, and uh, uh, how we use big data to identify ties between political and economic elites. And unfortunately, this research has had zero impact on our public debate on Russia. So one uh, 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 goal in this book is really to bring this research to light. I mean, um, it, it's really high quality research and you know, Greg said that I tried to be on the forefront, but 
but I'm really pedaling as fast as I can just to keep up with my younger colleagues who are doing a lot of this terrific research. Uh, the third way uh, that the book, I think, departs from a lot of writing on Russia is that I mix in a lot of personal anecdotes of my uh, adventures and misadventures in Russia over the last 30 years. Um, you'll learn about how I worked uh, as an exhibit guide on the cultural exchange in six Soviet cities in the late 1980s. And uh, for many Russians, I was the, one of the first Americans uh, that they met. And these encounters you know, shed an awful lot of light on what it's like uh, to live under a, an autocracy. Um, I also described some of my experiences working in the Russian Securities and Exchange Commission in the 1990s and what it's been like to head a research institute in Moscow at the Higher School of Economics over the last uh, decade. Um, I think these anecdotes make the book a better read. Some of them are, I think are kind of funny. Um, they also provide insights that are hard to come by unless you've spent a lot of time uh, in Russia. And I think they give a tone to the book that's different uh, from a lot of uh, writing on Russia. And um, just to wrap up, um, I think it's really hard to change people's minds on Russia. Both sides or all sides of the debate on Russia, people are really dug in hard. Um, but I hope that this book will provide a little nuance, a little complexity, and reduce some of the bile that seems de rigueur in uh, contemporary discussions about Russia. So by putting Russia in a comparative perspective, by using uh, social science evidence, by paying more attention to Russian society, I hope I'm trying to get past a lot of the too easy arguments that are made about Russia and to provide a clearer and richer picture about Russian politics today. Thank you very much. And I really look forward uh, to hearing all of your comments. Thank you, Tim. Um, so we'll turn to our panelists now. Um, um, so we decided on a batting order prior to the uh, start of the panel. And uh, first up is uh, Keith Gessen, who is the George T. Delacorte Assistant Professor of Magazine Journalism at the Columbia Journalism School. Keith, please take it away. Hi, everybody. Um, thank you for having me. Um, and, and Tim, thank you for this uh, really fun and, and very useful book, um, which, which really does cover uh, a tremendous amount of ground um, and, and summarizes in a succinct and, and, and entertaining way um, a lot of political science research that I actually wasn't aware of. Um, I learned uh, two terms that I, I can't believe I have lived um, this long on earth without knowing. Uh, one was um, autocratic legalism, um, a description of how uh, the Kremlin and other regimes just kind of buries people in, in lawsuits and, and, and the sort of uh, um, uh, appearance of legality um, as a form of repression, um, but a very kind of boring form of repression. Um, uh, I thought that was really interesting. And, and also the concept of uh, rational ignorance, um, you know, for why uh, people in a place like Russia might choose uh, to think certain things or to um, ignore certain things, uh, not because um, they don't know about them, but because it does not serve their interest uh, to know about um, how the regime is behaving. Uh, because there's nothing they can do about it. And in fact, uh, nothing good could come of it uh, for them. So rational ignorance, I thought was a, a very useful term. And in general, I just thought, um, I really look forward to kind of waving this book at people, um, you know, on, on Twitter in particular, uh, who don't know what they're talking about um, with regard to Russia. Um, I, I had kind of four um, general thoughts or, or questions really. Um, I don't know that we'll have time to, to, to answer all of them, but I, I thought I'd bring them up. Um, so the first one was the question of kind of Russian specificity. Um, and, and, and your point, your points, you know, really well taken. I mean, one of the a kind of alternate title for the book that I kept thinking of was um, an average autocracy, right? Um, this, you know, the, the, the Putin regime uh, really resembles so many other um, contemporary autocratic regimes. Uh, and, and it seems to have more in common with, you know, uh, Viktor Orban's regime or, or Tariq Erdogan's regime um, uh, that more in common with those regimes than it does with the Stalinist regime, right? So that seemed like a very useful uh, corrective to the way we, we typically talk about uh, uh, Putin and the Kremlin. Um, and yet, you know, when certain kind of uh, more specific features of Russia were mentioned, my interest um, increased. Uh, so, um, you know, the fact that Russia is well-educated, 
um, you know, sort of more educated than most um, contemporary autocratic regimes. I thought that was interesting. Um, its geopolitical position is unique. Um, um, uh, it is more powerful than most autocratic regimes. It is, uh, you know, using your taxonomy, it is the most powerful um, personalist autocracy, right? Given that China is a, is a party autocracy, as you say. So um, it made me wonder, you know, uh, ultimately whether the kind of Russia's path out of autocracy um, you know, is going to depend on those factors. And, and you talk a little bit about that in your conclusion, but I, I thought that was interesting and kind of um, became curious about that. Um, similarly, the question of public opinion, I really enjoyed reading about all the ingenious ways um, you and other uh, political scientists, you know, structure these surveys to make sure that they're yielding um, valid data. I thought that was fascinating. Um, and, and you make the really important point that is, often lost in discussions of Russia, that the Kremlin can't just um, gin up support for any old policy, right? So Crimea, yes, um, you know, strong and durable support, as you say, uh, but Donbass, not so much, and Syria, not at all, right? Um, and, 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 you know, and, and, and as you point out, you know, ultimately the economy is the, just as in the United States, you know, you can tell whether a president is going to be reelected depending on the performance of the economy. Um, so Putin's popularity is, is very much dependent on the performance of the economy. Um, but you do also say that uh, political elites can mobilize opinion, right? Um, and it, it, it made me wonder, you know, which, of, which kind of store of opinion is mobilizable? Right. And um, so, yes, Crimea is a kind of unique, has a kind of unique, uh, you know, valence in Russian, you know, history and culture. But but what about Minsk? <laughs> um, you know, what about Kiev? Right. I, you know, I think that's, an, you know, it's a bit of alarmist uh, statement, but, you know, um, I could imagine um, Kiev suddenly, you know, people saying, well, Kiev, of course. Right. We had to have Kiev. Um, I don't really think that's going to happen, but, um, you know, so, and we, we did see it in Ukraine, right, where um, these kind of fissures along, you know, ethnic or linguistic lines, which, you know, periodically would lay dormant, you know, in, in Ukrainian politics, uh, did get mobilized, um, you know, in, during, around Maidan, right? Um, so, so I would like to know more about which opinions could be mobilized and, and, and which, you know, really are, 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 the Kremlin can't, can't do that. Um, and then, you know, the third sort of similar thing that I, I was thinking about as I read was, you know, what is the theory of change um, that um, we can come out of this book with? So I, I thought a lot about um, a, a Russian political scientist I really admire, Dmitry Furman. I, I'm sure you know his work, right? You know, who, who, who uh, looking at post-Soviet regimes, you know, kind of said, well, if, if you look at the, the pseudo democracies that they've set up, it kind of leaves them open, vulnerable to the problem of elections, right? As you say, uh, these autocratic leaders want to be popular and they have decided to continue having elections. Um, and, it, you know, Furman argued that, that it was at those points that you, you, you had these crises, right, of legitimacy. If you, if you stole the election too obviously, right, this is when you would have problems. Um, I wonder if you think that that is no longer valid um, in the Russian case. Certainly it seems like the Kremlin has um, figured out a way around that by eliminating the, the opposition um, earlier on, you know, before it gets to the point of the election. Um, kind of incredible to think that Navalny, one of his, uh, before he was poisoned, one of the things that he was doing was thinking of, of a way to do smart voting during elections, right? So, uh, so the election's still in play in Russia in 2020. As a, as a kind of factor of contention, it, kind of amazing. It's not how we think of Putin's Russia at all. Um, so, you know, so I do wonder coming out of all this research, how does this end, right? How do we get out of this situation? Um, and the final question, you, which you touch on in, in the conclusion, um, I do wonder what you, and, and maybe the, the most relevant for, for this discussion is how do we, why has our discourse on Russia been so debased? Right, um, and there are these kind of objective historical factors: the the Trump situation, the the hacking, right? Um, <laughs> you know, being being a person who who uh, wants to have you know kind of 
constructive relations with Russia means that you are pro-Trump, right? Uh, up until a few months ago. Um, we are now watching a kind of character assassination of Matt Rajonsky, right? Um, before our eyes, um, uh, which I find, you know, really disturbing. Um, and, you know, and yet we, we also have a, a, a fair amount of academic work. Um, we have you, uh, we have a lot of people who have um, done good research, which doesn't um, always make it out into the kind of mainstream discourse. So I, I wonder if you think something has changed um, in the last, you know, five, 10, 20, 30 years that has made uh, talking about Russia in a, in a constructive and, and reasonable way more difficult in this country. Um, so those are the those are the four things. But I, I really um, again thank such a such a useful and delightful book. Um, I'm very grateful to have it. Thanks, Keith, for those interesting questions. Um, pretty expansive questions. Tim, do you want to respond while they're still fresh, or shall we wait? Why, why don't we wait and, and and I'll pick them up. Hopefully, people have forgotten about the really hard questions, so then I can pick and choose with a little more discretion. So, uh, um, but okay. I, I will try to get to them. Okay, great. Well, Keith, make, let's make sure Tim doesn't get to dodge anything. Um, uh, next up is Stephen Kotkin, who is the John P. Birkeland 52 Professor in History and International Affairs at Princeton University. Thank you. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to be here today. Uh, Professor Fry, congratulations on the book. Uh, from my point of view as an uh, obligated reader, uh, we have far too many books on Russia, sadly. Uh, but we have far too few good books on Russia. And then and Professor Fry's book falls into the latter category, which makes this a pleasurable experience. So um, a long time ago in the late 80s and early 90s, uh, Russians were saying uh, that they wanted to be a normal country. And this was true of the vast majority of people you would speak to, even in the provinces who were far away from foreigners like myself. Uh, well, Professor Fry's argument is that Russia is a normal country. It has become a normal country. It is a normal personalist autocracy, but it is normal. It is not unique. Uh, Putin kills journalists. Uh, personalist autocracies kill journalists. Uh, Putin emasculates a parliament or the judiciary. That's what personalist autocracies do. They emasculate any limits on executive power. Um, Putin's regime is corrupt. Yeah, well, all personalist autocracies is corrupt. So we're dealing with a just another normal country here. It's not a normal country in the way that those people I spoke to in the late 80s and 90s were hoping. They were hoping for a normal country in the uh, West European social democratic welfare state, high standard of living rule of law sense. But nonetheless, we're normal here. Uh, Professor Fry is not happy that Russia is a normal country in this personalist autocratic sense. It's clear that he would prefer that it was more normal in the Western European sense. But nonetheless, if Russia is normal, then it's amenable to social science research, to being understood through social science, because any country can be understood through social science. The beauty of the book, which differentiates it from the vast majority of books published on Russia, is that it's empirical. It's full of evidence. Uh, most uh, Russia books are evidence-free. And they're full of argument, they're full of assertion, they're full of all sorts of stuff, personal experience, uh, but they don't have any evidence uh, for the most part, or the evidence that they have is made up. So here we have a book which is just completely laden with empiricism. Some of it Professor Fry is, is summarizing from other scholars, and some of it he carried out himself of, in very clever, sophisticated uh, surveys, political and sociological research. So this is very refreshing and very judicious, and this alone makes the book a necessary read for anybody interested in Russia. However, the argument of the book uh, kind of, uh, well, how to put it, the book makes you think nobody's gonna read it because there seems to be a lot of demand for a simplified, mythologized, politicized understanding of Russia. In other words, he's fighting against that, but the fact that that seems to be so pervasive 
and makes him so angry, it seems to be a problem. Now, I would argue that this is not, of course, specific to Russia at all. If Russia is a normal country, simplified, mythologized, politicized understandings of a country, that's even more universal than Russia as a personalist autocracy. We could have a long discussion about US views on China. We could have an even long discussion about US views on America. They are simplified, mythologized, and politicized. So we have a tension here between the desire to mobilize the social science and normalize Russia, and the fact that that doesn't happen for any country, Russia included. There's no analysis in the book of why every country is simplified, mythologized, and politicized. And that would be a good question for another time. So that's the global commonality. Quote, unfortunately, social science research has had little impact on public discourse about Russia and its relationship to the rest of the world. Scratch out Russia and put in any country you'd like to put. Okay. Another issue I'd like to raise for Professor Fry to uh, consider is that he has set up the interpretations as mutually exclusive. In other words, there's this fantastic social science research that he wants to spotlight. And then there are these ignoramuses who indulge in Putinology and in history or tradition. And so he's juxtaposed them as if they're mutually exclusive. That's a very interesting rhetorical strategy. It doesn't really work for him. Uh, first of all, there are people, I won't mention any names, but who have taught at Princeton for 35 years and have argued that Russia is a authoritarian country like other authoritarian countries, but that leadership matters and that traditions, history and institutions matter. But he set them up as mutually exclusive rather than complementary, so that forces him to sneak back with uh, th through the back door phrases like, well, Putin's KGP background is, quote, not irrelevant, and on it goes. So the rhetorical strategy is, uh, is interesting, but I wonder if it advances the social science argument because it's not a social science rhetorical strategy. Okay, what's the question? we're actually trying to explain here. What is the question that puzzles us, that we don't understand, that Professor Fry is helping us understand? Well, you might think that the question is, how does this particular personalist autocracy fit in to other personalist autocracies? But that's not actually what the book says. The book says it is one like that, but in fact, it gives a lot of examples of Russia's being different. In fact, the problem here is that Russia is not just a personalist autocracy today, but it's a personalist autocracy yesterday and the day before yesterday and the 100 years before that and the 300 years before that and the 700 years before that. So Russia is on a 700 year plus transition to something other than personalist autocracy, which not a lot of countries are on that transition or on that trajectory. And so in the end, he must in fact talk about the things that he said are mutually exclusive, which are problems like explaining why Russia is still Russia and not, for example, Germany, which has had also episodes of personalist autocracy, but is not like that today. Moreover, we then get some stuff that's very sneaky, very sneaky. For example, compared to other countries, quote, Russia is too rich and too well educated to be non-democratic, corrupt, to be so non-democratic, corrupt, and illiberal. So it's a personal autocracy like other ones, but it shouldn't be. Somebody made a mistake. The place is too well educated to be so non-democratic, corrupt, and illiberal. Russia is exceptional, for, for, but why? Why is it on the wrong path? Why is it like other, not unique, like other modern personalist autocracies? And why is it on this 700 year transition out of something that it can't get out of? 
I'll make two final points if that's okay. What is weak? We have a weak strong man. What's very interesting about a weak strong man is he can murder people at will. He can take away their property. He can do a lot of things that, for example, Professor Fry can't do. And Professor Fry is a powerful academic with tenure at a major research institution. And we wouldn't call him a weak academic. I think we would call him a strong academic based upon his amazing uh, publication record, his teaching evaluations. What's amazing about the argument of a weak strong man is that I don't know how you could be a strong strong man because all the problems that make him weak are things Putin does himself. He continually weakens his own rule. There's a kind of structural limitation. If Professor Fry's argument is correct, you can't have a strong, strong man because they step on themselves all the time. They undermine themselves by being too corrupt or fill in the blank in his many arguments. So I'd like to know how you can be a strong, strong man and why some strong, strong men are strong and why some other strong men seem to be condemned structurally to being weak because of all these trade-offs that they face. A final point, and uh, this is a point that's now becoming very popular. I saw it in foreign affairs under someone else's name recently. Uh, the absence of an alternative uh, colors everything. I've been making this argument ever since I understood Bolshevism. So some people might argue I still don't understand Bolshevism, but uh, uh, Keith, you already had your chance today. And this is not about me, this is about Professor Fry. But Bolshevism was not good at anything. It couldn't feed the people. It couldn't organize transport. I could go on and I could go on, it was a mess. But there was one thing it just excelled at. And that was destroying any hint of an alternative. It would crush immediately with all its force, the hint of an alternative. And so the absence of an alternative is what colors everything in today's Russia, including those extremely clever and subtle surveys that Professor Fry himself engineered with his colleagues. So that point, I would argue, is not deeply enough appreciated in the many interesting arguments in the book. And that is to say that the absence of an alternative, which uh, uh, also Keith Gessen alluded to, in talking about eliminating candidates before you even get to the problem of needing to manipulate the election. It does make it a lot easier, I have to say. We can't do that, uh, unfortunately, in our faculty meetings, uh, as well as these personalist autocracies seem to be able to do. So in conclusion, let me reiterate that this is a very good book on Russia, that there are a lot of good books on Russia that you should never read let alone buy. But this is one of them that you should now open up your phone and go on Amazon and order immediately because it's empirically rich, full of evidence, very clever in its use of social science and deployment of social science and does make a lot of important arguments about how to contextualize Russia not solely or predominantly in personalistic, in, the, in the, the personality of the individual ruler or in the history and tradition, but in the way these kinds of regimes behave. And that's a very valuable lesson for anybody who's trying to understand Russia today. So heartfelt congratulations and thank you once again for the invitation today. Thank you for those very challenging comments. I'm looking forward to hearing Tim's response. But first, we're going to uh, hear comments from uh, Vicky Murillo, um, who is a professor of the Department of Political Science and the School of International and Public Affairs at Columbia and is currently director of the Institute for Latin American Studies. Vicky. Thanks, uh, Greg. Thanks for the invitation. I now I understand Keith's comment about coming after Stephen. Um, and the risk in which I got myself is kind of difficult. Um, so I, I am not so a specialist as opposed to the, my prior, my, the prior two panelists. I know very little about Russia. So 
I learned a lot about this book. I'm a comparativist. I worked on Latin America. I think this is a pretty extraordinary book. It's very well written. It's strong. It has a very, you know, it does a lot in weaving many different empirical uh, information about Russia in a way that it comes all together and, and allows those of us that are interested in Russia but study other parts of the world to, to understand Russia, but to understand it in a comparative perspective. And so let me make four comments and end with a question. Um, so the first is, I, I think we as comparativists uh, learn a lot about, about contemporary Russia. So what's interesting is that this authoritarian, competitive authoritarianism is the way we call it, is quite different from the Soviet totalitarian past. Although none of them are democratic, the, the Russia of today is different from the Russia of the past. Uh, and part of this difference is what allowed the book to be written, because now, although uh, this is an authoritarian government, there is enough freedom to get the information that allows researchers to uh, produce uh, the studies that really build this work. Uh, and using these studies is that Tim points at the, as he said, as the constraints on, on Putin's on Putin's work, which are similar to other personalistic authoritarian regime. But that, uh, you know, I think the one that I find uh, stronger is that he does need a repressive bureaucracy. But on the other hand, the repressive bureaucracy could not be strong enough so as to overthrow him, right? So the tension of the need of repression but a repressive system that is not enough uh, to kill yourself. So this goes over a lot of uh, other uh, aspects of the state and, and the balancing act of, 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 of this authoritarian regime as, as any other. The second thing that I think makes him more than the rest of the world is that he is very dependent on popularity. I think this is not, again, unique of, of personalistic authoritarian regimes, even of, of party authoritarian regimes. I think China, Mexico, other countries have seen this. But he cannot control the mechanisms that he facilitates his popularity for the, you know, first, he's very dependent on the economy like everyone else. But this is an economy that's based on natural resources and pr prices that he doesn't control. So. Uh, it's very much out of his control. And even things that are within his control are like double swords, double edged swords, like the nationalistic foreign policy, of course, works like everywhere else, the invasion of Crimea. But it has cost in the relationships with allies and, and non allies. So uh, many things that he does to become popular have a lot of costs that make him uh, weaken. Uh, again, this is a problem that's not unique to Putin, it's not unique to Russia, but I think the theme uh, emphasizes how it is important. And I think in this case, the geopolitics of it are, are quite unique to Russia, in that Russia is a world player, but not a strong world player. Uh, and in fact, that's something that uh, Tim emphasized in his discussion of cybersecurity, right? It's, it's the weapons of the week. They really do not have weapons to invade other countries, so they need to do uh, cyber terrorism. Uh, the other thing that is very important in this book is how much has political science has changed in the study of Russia since the fall of the Soviet Union. I'm, I'm, I came to grad school a little bit after Tim, so I do remember, you know, the people who were the older people were studying the Soviet Union, and then the young generation was studying, you know, what came afterwards. Uh, and, and he relies on a work of political science work that's published by him, by his colleagues, by his students, I have to say, by a lot of Russian colleagues, uh, and uses to, uh, to analyze Russia. And I think the, the reliance on surveys that is less risky because people have less, you know, less estates and there's clever ways of, of measuring, uh, has replaced the, the old Sovietology. But here, Tim is uh, uh, unhappy that this is not considered by policymakers. And so the book, in a sense, is a call of, OK, here is here are the sources of information that should be considered. But they also saw it as a call for scholars uh, to move beyond the academic journals and to try to engage in, in the policy discussion, especially to this younger generation that's so 
uh, focus on, on, on publishing in top journals, which is what rewards us in the profession, but to what extent to make it uh, other forms of production that are digestible for the public and that can, uh, you know, be part of the conversation, maybe not of the conversation in TV, uh, but yes, of the conversations among uh, policymakers and activists that have a stake in the game. And, and finally, uh, I think that uh, this is a book that I really want to emphasize the personal uh, aspect in things here. And he started going to Russia when he was still the Soviet Union. And he keeps talking about his own view as it becomes Russia. And I think that is what it makes it so clear, I mean, beyond the history, and I want to come back to the history, the idea that it is a different animal. It's true, none of them are democratic, but this is not the Soviet Union. I don't know if the category of totalitarianism is still around uh, in political science, but it seems that they are very, very different uh, uh, regimes, uh, to say. And in the concluding chapter, I think this has a transition post Putin. And a personalistic regime, it's always hard to move in a transition because you have to do something with the guy, right? Uh, in, in a, it's, that's, it's important what to do with autocrats. Uh, in a, in, so it's much harder than in a party, uh, out, uh, in a party regime. Um, and, and, and I was also, as a Latin American, is uh, uh, a little shocked by your comparison with Latin America. It's true, Russia is richer, is more educated, levels of inequality are lower. And yet, uh, Latin America, or many countries in Latin America, had much longer experience with competitive elections, even, you know, under, only for males, uh, from most of the 20th century than Russia did. Uh, so even in cases of authoritarianism like Mexico, you, and that was considered by the U.S. political science for democracy in the 1960s, although not by Mexicans, uh, you had a competitive elections or semi-competitive elections, uh, and many countries in the region had long experience or relatively longer experience with democracy. And so one thing that is really interesting about Russia and the point that Stephen makes is that it has no experience really with democracy. So it seems hard uh, to, to think of a transition to something that is unknown in the country, right? And, and you never, in the conclusion, when you discuss the transition at the end, you don't you know, talk about the history and how much that history uh, shapes uh, what will come. It's simply that I think it's different from the Soviet Union, and the Soviet Union had an alternative to democracy. I think the narrative of the Soviet Union of the Bolsheviks was an alternative to democracy. That alternative is not there anymore. That's why we have a competitive authoritarian regime, like a fake democracy. But it's not clear to what extent that history of no experience to democracy is going to shape the future. And you talk very little about the history in the book. You talk a little bit about Soviet uh, repression and impact on turnout. But I, I agree with Stephen that what was absent for me in thinking about the book was the role of history in, in defining uh, contemporary theory. But this is, again, a fantastic book, and in particular, a fantastic book for someone like me who's a comparativist and who wanted to learn about Russia uh, in a comparative perspective. Thanks a lot for the invitation. Thank you, Vicky, for those insights and, and comments and questions. Uh, so, Tim, according to our schedule, you have five minutes to respond to all of these uh, questions. I'm going to ask that you uh, respond to the most difficult questions first. Uh, thanks a lot. First, really terrific set of con uh, comments. This is the first book panel um, uh, that I've done, and it's uh, really terrific to get these uh, uh, comments, some of which I, you know, kind of anticipated in the writing and some, you know, some that are new. Uh, let me start with uh, Keith's comment about why his discourse been so debased on Russia. And, you know, there is a lot of that um, debate lurking in the background in the book, and I don't really take it on um, head on. And that was a conscious decision because I was afraid that that would then just get the hackles up and reinforce the kind of polarization and compel me into one camp or another. 
And one thing about the book is there's a lot of stuff for each side of the uh, Russia hawk, Russia dove divide to not like. I mean, the Russia hawks won't like it to learn that when we did these surveys of Putin in 2015, yes, people weren't lying when uh, they uh, answered the question about uh, Putin's approval. And the, you know, Rachel Maddow's, uh, uh, the kind of Russia hysterics um, in the Trump era won't like to hear that when you look at Russian efforts in 2016, the chances that they, you know, turn the election in Trump's favor are really, you know, really pretty low. So um, uh, that was a conscious choice not to take that debate head on. Uh, part of the reason why the Russia um, discourse is so debased is it's hard to study Russia. It's far away, it's opaque. And that gives people lots of room to make all kinds of claims that are hard to, uh, hard to disprove. Uh, Russia doesn't help things uh, in this sense and that they often politicize the debate themselves uh, in ways that are uh, not helpful at all. But one question I kept going back to is kind of what evidence could I give somebody that would a fair-minded reader consider uh, pers you know, persuasive? And there's some part of the readership that you're never going to persuade. So what I tried here was really lo roll, load the dice in favor and just keep, you know, coming at the reader with more uh, and more evidence. And then at the end, you know, people are going to think uh, what they're going to think. So, um, uh, but re really interesting points. Uh, and then your second point about Russian specificity and that kind of rolls into to, to, to Steve's points as well. And um, this was a real tension in the book. And uh, maybe I go overboard on trying to paint Russia too much as a normal uh, autocracy. Uh, that too uh, was something of a choice in that so much of writing about Russia is in the vein that Putin is unlike other leaders, that Russia is so unique, that I was, you know, pushing against that. And, you know, you, you, you might think that I uh, uh, go too far. Um, uh, uh, but also, I, I, that was really kind of a corrective based on where I think much of the writing on Russia is today, because you have to make a choice, right? Either, you know, there's a lot of implicit non-comparison of Russia to other countries where people only look at Russia and then their explanations are rooted only in factors that occur in Russia. And then by definition, you can't know whether, you know, the processes that are going on within Russia are the same as in other countries. So uh, in trying to balance off, you know, what makes Russia special and what makes it uh, comparative, uh, uh, you know, you really do have to take a comparative approach to find out what's different about Russia. Uh, you know, uh, that Russia is better educated, you know, uh, that, uh, 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 you know, that there's not much evidence that Russians are less interested in politics than, uh, or less interested in participating in politics than in other countries. The way you, uh, you, the way you establish that is by looking outside. So only by looking outside can we then figure out what is unique and what is not unique about uh, Russia. Um, on the comments about that I set these arguments up as mutually exclusive. And uh, yeah, that's, that's, that's a good criticism. Uh, I'm an area studies guy originally. I was Russian language and literature. So uh, uh, you know, as a major, as an undergraduate. So what I think is really exciting about the new research on Russia is that you know, my students and the, the kind of younger generation, they're not only really well-trained in social science, They've spent a lot of time on the ground in Russia. Uh, uh, you know, they've tra traveled the country, and they, uh, uh, you know, and you know, a lot of the young Russians who come to the U.S. and study uh, and come back and really marry the best of a social science approach and a deep understanding uh, of the, of the country. So, um, uh, uh, you know, that I think distinguishes a lot of this work. Um, yeah, on the the weak strong man. Um, uh, I struggled with this. Um, no one's going to buy a book that's titled The Constrained Strong Man or The, the Moderately Weak Strong Man. And uh, the text is, is more measured uh, uh, than the title. 
And uh, uh, you know, Steve says that I'm a strong man. I appreciate. I, my students don't always seem to uh, uh, hold that that point of view. Um, the the point I'm trying to make here is, I think, in a lot of discussions uh, about Russia in the West, there is this assumption that because Putin is unrivaled politically, that he can just do whatever he wants. The bureaucracy just snaps uh, to his orders because uh, you know he is all powerful and he is such a persuasive character. Uh, you know, in the West, Putin is probably reading your emails right now uh, because he has this incredible, uh, you know, incredibly powerful KGB that has these ways to, or FSB that's able to, you know, uh, uh, manipulate uh, the internet in ways that, that lead to Russia's advantage. And uh, I want to push back against those views and really, you know, look at what, you know, aspects, what can Putin do really well, uh, crush the, the, the political opposition and to make alternatives less appealing. If you look, for example, at the approval ratings, it's not just that Putin's approval ratings have been high. Uh, no one else's ratings have been high. Everyone else, there's a big gap between Putin uh, and everybody else in the approval ratings. So I take Steve's uh, uh, a point um, uh, quite well. And on um, uh, segueing into to, you know, Vicky's point about, um, Shortchanging history here, and that's a, that. That's a serious charge, uh, and I think, you know, we're we're often forced to to make trade-offs in you know, particularly in writing a book for a general audience. You really got to keep people turning the pages, and uh, it forced me to um, you know cut out a lot of uh, topics that I would have liked to have spent. Uh, more time uh, uh, talking about. One of this is the, the kind of history of personalism in Russia. Uh, Russia has had personalism. Lots of countries have had personalist experiences for long uh, 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 periods of time. And even if we think though about Russia, you know, the Khrushchev and Brezhnev era had a lot of uh, 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 collective decision-making at the highest levels. In the, the, the Yeltsin era, you had um, Yeltsin, who was very much a kind of personalistic ruler, but he had to struggle every year to get the budget passed through the, through the Duma. And that was an epic battle each year. Um, and the point I want to make is that Putin's Russia is very different, uh, uh, very different from that. Um, in that, in collecting so much power in his own hands, it allows him to do certain things uh, but not others. And a lot of those other things are important for building power within Russia. Um, you know, if you have the power to expropriate people, it's very difficult to get people to invest. It's very difficult to get businesses to innovate. Um, and that's kind of this paradox. And, and Steve has talked about in some of his writing as well about uh, this kind of impotence of omnipotence. Uh, you know, if you have all power, you know, you just don't have the time and energy uh, to resolve uh, all problems, and it creates lots of unintended consequences that I try to try to point out in the book. So, uh, Tim, we, we a have a, a few questions from the audience that Great. we can pose. Um, uh, we could we could devote another hour to just having some back and forth <laughs> on the questions the panelists have proposed, but we want to give the audience a chance. Uh, so, here's the first question: One topic not uh, that has not been mentioned in the discussion. Um, and I look to the table of contents and index, it's not mentioned in the book, is the role played by Putin's organized crime connections in his policy choices. These have been very well documented, extend back at least since he worked in charge of contract approval in the St. Petersburg mayor's office in the early 1990s and became involved in an infamous port and oil for food scandal and are clearly connected to major international groups. While many authoritarian leaders like Maduro find themselves cooperating with organized crime groups, it seems that few of them had those ties so early in their careers uh, before they made it to a high power position. Does this set Putin apart? Um. So I, I do mention uh, Putin's experience in the uh, uh, Leningrad city government and the uh, uh, charges that there, he was in charge of a kind of uh, 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 a, a food um, import program in which money went, uh, money came, uh, 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 money went out of the country and food never really came into the country. And there's lots of allegations that 
you know, Putin was deeply involved in this. Um, Catherine Belton's book covers those topics in so much better detail uh, uh, than I can. Um, and, uh, you know, that's really not uh, what, what this book is about. And it's also, you know, not unique uh, for, uh, uh, you know, leaders to uh, rely on all kinds of agents at their, their uh, uh, disposal. Now, whether or not that colors his, his economic policy or his foreign policies, that's the kind of analysis that I don't want to do in a book like this because it would require an awful lot of speculation and an awful lot of relying on sources that I think would, would, would likely be uh, pretty dubious. Uh, second question. Um, and if, uh, by the way, if anybody wants to jump in on these points, I mean, we have a tremendous amount of, uh, of expertise here. Uh, so I'd be, I'd be you know, more than happy to, to, to hear from the, the panelists as well. Uh, in the meantime, let's move to the second question. Uh, you mentioned that performance does matter even in personal dictatorships. Which policy areas do you find to be strong on, quote, good performance in Russia, and does it matter for outcomes, given the foreign, uh, foreign policy cripples, many efforts on the economic front? So it, uh, Putin has been extremely good on the macro economy. Uh, his great pitch to Russians is, is that I brought you stability after the chaos of the 1990s. And he did manage the inflow of the petrodollars into the Russian economy you know, in a way that uh, you know, was not detrimental to the economy as has happened in uh, lots of other countries. So he's also uh, hired a very good central banker who's kept uh, macroeconomic stability a, a really high uh, priority. Also, if you look at things like um, uh, uh, LNG production, uh, Gazprom uh, was tasked with developing this oil field, uh, the Stockman, or the, the, um, uh, an oil field well in, in the north of Russia. They bungled the job. Uh, Putin said, uh, no, we're going to give this uh, uh, to another company to develop. And you know, they brought it to market you know, two years ahead of schedule. The Sochi Olympics you know, uh, uh, building the bridge to Crimea. If you look at these targeted, the, the Sputnik vaccine as well, Sputnik V vaccine, if you look at these targeted uh, uh, efforts, um, the Russian state can uh, marshal resources to resolve specific problems. What it's not good at is generating the kinds of economic dynamism that comes from uh, innovation and new inventions and uh, creating a uh, level economic playing field so that people with good ideas are rewarded rather than people uh, with good, connect good connections to the state. Um, in foreign policy too, you know, the annexation of Crimea was wildly popular uh, and it really bought Putin four years of peace even as the uh, economy started uh, to slow down. So that, from his point of view, you know, was a really uh, a wise move. Uh, you, know, uh, uh, you know, in other areas, um, uh, uh, you know, it's, um, you know, road building. There's lots of things that we could look at in, in, in uh, uh, detail and see where uh, the Kremlin uh, is not so good at doing those kinds of activities. I, I cite one there's a great study at the World Bank, which looks at the cost of building a road in Finland and in northern Russia on the other side of the border. And the cost of building it in Russia are three times higher than in Finland, even though the climactic conditions are exactly the same. So that's the kind of thing that Russia is not so great at. Uh, next question. What consequences flow from your uh, book for concrete policies with regard to Russia? The team around Biden are they more amenable to a more reality-based approach than you argue for in, that you argue for in your book? Well, I hope they read the book. Uh, hope they buy the book. Um, uh, uh, what what I think the the main policy point I think to take away from the book is to uh, uh, have a really clear-eyed view of Russia and what it is and where it's going to recognize that uh, Russia is not on the brink of an economic collapse and just a few more sanctions is going to push them uh, over the edge. 
um, that there's not this mass groundswell of support that only if uh, you know Putin stumbles, there will be a uh, uh, you know a mass uh, uh, revolt to try to to to, to bring down uh, the regime. At the same time, uh, I think that the book speaks to making policy towards Russia not based on Putin, not to personalize relationships. That's what Putin is really good at. He did that with Schroeder in Germany. He did that with Berlusconi in Italy. I think a Russia policy needs to look beyond Putin and recognize that there are many voices within the Kremlin that might want to hear a different message than the one that Putin wants to hear, that there are many voice groups within Russian society that would like to see a, a better relations and a more uh, 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 predictable uh, uh, relationship. And those kinds of messages you know, should be part of the package of how we approach uh, Russia. So there's not kind of concrete policy proposals about what to do on you know, New START or uh, how to handle uh, uh, you know, Russian trade policy. But the book does generate, I think, an approach towards viewing Russia that could inform policymakers. Thank you. Um, so I, uh, I was wondering if you could say more about, um, to go back to uh, Keith's question about what your, uh, what your theory of change is, uh, including for Russia and what could change and, and why would it change? Well, one um, view is that uh, Putin's 20 plus years in power are par for the course for the region. If you look at Uzbekistan, Kazakhstan, Nazarbayev was in power for 20, 29 years. Uh, Lukashenko has been in power for six years longer than Putin. Uh, uh, the personalist autocracies in the former Soviet space are very long lived. And even if we look outside of the former Soviet space, autocratic regimes tend to last on average of about 15 years. And the way that change has tended to not come about uh, is, uh, the rep is when a leader dies, uh, uh, which has been uh, you know, what we've seen in uh, Azerbaijan, Uzbekistan, and some other places. In Kazakhstan, Nazarbayev has stepped down, but that's been a very you know, difficult uh, 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 transition. Uh, so one way is simply that Putin will stay in power for a long period of time, that Russia will be in this nasty equilibrium of slow growth, a sort of popular leader, but with no alternatives to uh, rally um, uh, a version of Russia that is you know, better able to satisfy the uh, needs of the majority uh, uh, of its citizens. Um, uh, another way that change might come about is through um, uh, you know, changes in the, in the economy. Um, uh, as Russia's economy um, uh, faces, the changes in the global energy market, uh, this makes it more difficult for an autocratic leader um, in that Putin's first you know, 10 years in power, he was able to satisfy the uh, uh, inner circle with tremendous rents beyond their belief, but also was able to satisfy the average Russian because living standards doubled in the first decade in office. You know, in the last four years, Putin has really started to have to make hard choices about you know, where does the next ruble go? Does it go to uh, the inner circle who are, um, uh, uh, you know, important for his rule, or do they go to trying to build uh, broader based um, uh, economic growth? So economic change might be, um, you know, one source of political change. On elections, um, you know, the nature of elections has changed a lot, as Keith has, uh, Keith pointed out. If earlier, Putin was able to win kind of honest majorities, uh, you know, we call them where, uh, you know, they're in the first decade in office, uh, Putin, you know, was able, I think, to claim that, uh, you know, yes, there was fraud, but, you know, most people believe that that fraud didn't have an impact on the election. The next round of elections, I don't think the parliamentary elections, but the presidential elections, you know, that's gonna be a much, much tougher challenge uh, uh, for Putin to claim that he is able to win an honest super, a majority if current, if current trends continue. So elections are another potential source where leaders can make mistakes, where they, as we see in Belarus, 
uh, Lukashenko stole too much in the elections and that got people uh, uh, on the streets in a country where there had been very little protest uh, you know, for, for two decades. Um, uh, I'm skeptical that change comes from without. Um, I think there's a lot of wishful thinking about uh, foreign, act, foreign countries' ability to, uh, to uh, manipulate domestic politics in Russia. Uh, it's just really hard. And uh, you know, I, I'm skeptical that that's the way uh, that political change will come about. We have another question from the audience. Um, I wonder whether the term personalist is a good one to describe Russia and other similar countries. The book seems to be making an argument that is, it is, not, it is really not about Putin, but the term personalist points exactly in the opposite direction. Are there other terms that we might use yeah. to describe this political system? Yeah, personalist is not a great term. It's the one that's commonly used uh, in, this, in this literature. Um, there are really regimes in which major policy and personnel decisions are made by a single individual, particularly the, the decision of when it's time to step down, right? So if in you know, you know, Mexico, uh, you know, every six years under the PRI, the party said, okay, your time is up, but we need to move on to somebody else. Um, or even in China until recently where they were able to manage a norm of you know, two terms for the, the, the general secretary. Um, in personalist regimes, uh, the, the leader decides uh, when it's time to go. Um, and usually they decide too late uh, 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 um, because there's all kinds of informational incentives of people at lower levels in the, the bureaucracy to hide a lot of the bad news. So we can't always assume that uh, 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 leaders um, who are politically unchallenged uh, are getting the, the best information about what's going on in the country. Uh, Tim, were there any questions, other, other or questions or comments from the panelists that you wanted to spend more time yeah, responding I'd to? I'm interested in, you know, in, in, in Steve and Keith and, and Vicky's view uh, about how do we handle this trade-off, this difficult, this, uh, this, uh, uh, of accounting for the specificity that's clearly there in the Russian case. Uh, the, the foreign policy chapter in the book is the one that I struggled with the most because in lots of ways, Russia is an atypical autocracy in foreign policy. And there is a whole literature in social science about the foreign policies of autocracies. And it you know, looks as large and cross-national uh, decision-making about foreign policy. And I didn't cite that literature precisely because I think, you know, Russia is very different from other kinds of uh, autocracies. At the same time, you know, I want to avoid trying to, you know, fetish, fetishize, fetishize the, you know, what is unique about Russia and, you know, putting too much explanatory power on, uh, you know, things that are, you know, if not uh, you know, unique, at least atypical uh, among autocracies. So, um, Professor Kotkin, do you have uh, any kind of rules of thumb? Your work does this, uh, you know, better than most historians where you, you know, look at, you know, Russia as a, you know, former colonial country like Britain and France and the difficulty of dealing with that. Uh, uh, yeah. Give yourself a little more credit, Professor Fry. Uh, you actually do this. So rhetorically, you hide some of your achievements uh, by uh, going after the simplified uh, ignoramuses who need a certain view of Russia or who are wedded to it. Uh, you actually have the sophisticated, even-handed, judicious, uh, Russia is normal country, but it has specificities too. Your rhetorical package doesn't do full justice uh, to your achievements in my view, but I've already stated that. But let's not imagine that you ignore uh, Russian history, Russian traditions, Russian institutions, that you ignore Putin's personality. In fact, you have all of that in the book and it's rightfully there. So um, let's not be beat ourselves up here with a stick as if we're in the banya and we're trying to get the most out of the steam here. 
Keith, Vicky. Uh, uh. Keith or Vicky, did you did you want to respond? I I agree. I I think the material is there, and I it's the most clear as you said in the chapter on foreign affairs, right? Because that's where the geopolitical role of Russia becomes evident. So you keep comparing Russia with Venezuela or Turkey or Hungary, yeah. but when you get to that chapter, that comparison doesn't hold, right? Yeah. And you, you bring China into the conversation. So certainly, I think you are, uh, you are doing it in the book. Uh, it's, it's, it's there. I, uh, I, I thought, what I saw it, thought it missing was in the conclusion, in the way you you finalize and I'm and, and thinking about the future. I, I would have like, uh, you know, especially because you make this comparison, which is at least for me a bit odd with the Latin American countries, that the history was so different. Yes, they're poor and so is India, uh, but they have a different history. And, uh, and Russia has such a long history of being an empire, but also of being a non-democratic or not even an electoral empire, so. I have a question, if I could, for Professor Kotkin, um, that you know relates to this discussion. Have you, you know, your your your, your talk of a seven hundred year transition, you know, to to democracy suggests that it's never going to happen. Um, have you a, a term that's come up in your work recently um, is path dependence, um, kind of a depressing term. Um, have you have you given up hope? Uh, this this is a, a question that Professor Fry has already answered, and I would prefer to let his answer stand here, and I would want the audience to focus on his book. Uh, Russia has had state collapse, and autocracy comes back. Yeah. It's had mass participatory revolution more than once, and autocracy comes back. So we have a problem that needs to be explained. Yeah. We don't necessarily have a cage that we live in. Uh, but, but it's been a long time since the kingdom of Novgorod, a very long time. But anyway, Professor Fry, back to you. <laughs> I, mean, I think uh, I quote actually, Steve, at one point in the book about historical legacies and uh, they're much harder to make persuasive than people commonly realize, you know? So, uh, you know, there's this really neat article by uh, Roya Talibova and Yuri Zhukov where they show that in districts within Russia where the purges were especially severe, uh, voting patterns in contemporary Russia are different than in regions where the purges were less severe. Turnout is lower, support for the regime is higher. Now, that's really interesting. Um, uh, uh, what we may, and, and that is much better, I think, than a lot of work which just says, look, you know, Russia's always had centralized power and Putin centralizing power. So therefore that's an explanation. No, that's a description. And, uh, you know, what we need is, you know, an explanation for why it's happening now, why uh, decentralization is happening or why centralization is happening rather than decentralization, because we've also seen that uh, in the Soviet period uh, and uh, in the Russia period. Um, so uh, I think there's this real, a lot of interesting work being done right now that looks at how the past affects the present. And it's a really difficult thing to do without just hand-waving about precisely what's the mechanism by which we had these purges back here in these villages in 1938, and then we see voting patterns in the early 1990s and they're different. Well, you know, what is the mechanism that, you know, makes that happen rather than just being, you know, two discrete events? Um, and it's really smart people doing interesting work uh, on that. And I just, you know, try to highlight a little bit, a little bit of that in the book. We have another question from the audience that could end the panel on a dramatic note. Um, do you believe Putin has a path to get out of the top spot alive? They all do. <laughs> they all have a plan. Um, uh, 
but it is, you know, as I make the, the point in the book, um, uh, it's difficult, and Vicky made this point too, is that it's difficult for these personalist uh, uh, rulers who have emasculated so many political institutions that would really be helpful to facilitate a transfer of power. Um, but having emasculated them, they don't provide a, a soft landing pad for these kinds of personalist uh, rulers. So, I mean, one strategy would be to kind of revert to a post in the security services uh, uh, that would make him uh, hard to dislodge. At the same time, it would also make uh, the new president of Russia, whoever that might be in a post-Putin era, um, very nervous. Uh, uh, and it would be difficult for that person to really exercise power fully um, uh, were Putin to still be around in the, uh, uh, in, in the political scene. So the, the challenge for Putin is that even if he would like to step down, uh, it's difficult to find a way uh, to tie the hands of your successor so that they'll leave you alone. Um, so we are just about out of time. Um, I want to thank the panelists. This was a terrific discussion. I wish it could go on for another hour. Um, maybe we'll have everybody back when we can all be in person in the same room together at some point. Um, but here's the book, Weak Strongman, The Limits of Power in Putin's Russia, published by Princeton University Press. Uh, please go out and buy it. Um, and uh, thanks again to everybody. Yeah, thanks, everybody. I really appreciated the comments. I thought they were terrific. So thank you. And thanks to ISERB for organizing.